We're going to be in Genesis chapter 15 tonight. Um, <laughs> can I get somebody who would like to read? Uh, let's read the whole thing. Uh, somebody want to read the first uh, 11? As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there. And they'll be afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And the sun had gone down, and it was dark. Behold, the smoking fire pot and the flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaim, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. All right, so we uh, read this text last week as well, and we talked about it. So I just want to kind of recap a little bit. For those of you who were here last week, what, what's some of the things that we talked about? What's some of the things that we, we discovered or we looked at in the text? What's going on? Well, I thought it was interesting where Abraham walked, uh, where God came between the, the sacrifice. Right. I, I have never... You know, understood. You know, right. Th that. Yeah. I'm still wanting to hear more about that tonight. But yeah, uh, that was seemed to be an important part of that chapter. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it starts out with Abram. What What's going on in Abram's life? What can we What can we kind of deduce from what uh, how the beginning of this chapter starts? He's having a little bit of. A issues with his faith and yeah. uh, he's getting older in age so he's starting to uh, I guess uh, he, he needs more reassurance I guess from God at that point in his life to continue on with God's work yeah we, we remember that Abram is a great man of faith absolutely and, and we see it in periods of his life but we also find that you know the scriptures don't cover over the fact that he was one who struggled at times and it seems to me, anyways, that when God says to him, comes to him in a vision, says, fear not, something must have been on Abram's mind that God would say those words to him. Um, uh, fear not. I think, I think there's something going on in his life. Now, we know that there's at least one thing on his mind because he brings it up. What's the one thing? Yeah, he doesn't have any kids. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't have any kids. So what's the big deal about not having any, any kids? He's got a promise that God will promise. That's all right. He's, He's got a promise. He's got a promise. All those yeah. Stars. And now it's been a while though, right? Yeah. It's been a while. And um, Abram seems to be thinking, where are you? What's going on? And we talked a little bit about that. We can have moments and times in our lives where we ask, where are you, God? I mean, can't we? Aren't there moments, maybe trials or situations or, or something? Maybe we're, even, maybe we're even walking with God, striving to be the best we can be, be faithful, and, and still life's pressures come down on us, and we might think, where are you? I, you know, I'm, I'm doing the best I can, and, and we can kind of struggle with suffering and trials and things of that nature. Um, I think, I think we can be like Abram. And that's important that we kind of see that these people that are found in the scriptures, faithful men and women of the Bible, are not superheroes. You know what I mean? They're not, it's not the man of steel. It's not terminators. They didn't walk through life and nothing affected them. They struggled at times. And, and that's important so we can get some assurance. If God is patient with someone like Abram, is that good news for us? That's my answer. Yeah. Yeah. It shows that he's patient even with us. And that, that's good news. Um, 
Now that doesn't give us any excuse for failures in, in, on our behalf or wavering in our faith, but there's just a recognition that even great men and women of the scriptures had those moments. So Abram's fearing, he's fearing um, really about his offspring. And it was mentioned a little bit, the, the reason that that's important is because back then children were a blessing. Um, and they were a big deal in that culture. In our day and age, they're less to a lot of people. They're less important. Uh, we live in a day and age where children are tossed out. Um, some people choose not to have children. Um, you know, they choose their careers and things like that. Back then, it was very odd not to have children. That's what you wanted, especially a male offspring, because a male offspring would do what? Carry on the name. Carry on the name. And so in a sense, you were able to live on through your children. There was something important about that. And, that, and we see that from the beginning of this. Don't also that all of your belongings, if you didn't have a male offspring, that, that your property and stuff didn't go to any of the females, didn't it go like back to... Yeah, culturally, in that period of time, yeah, it would have... Um, now, there's some, some stipulations that come in later on under the law of Moses and things of that nature, but... In the culture of that day and age, absolutely, that, that, that Abram is in, um, women were not, you know, they typically went with the husband and they didn't necessarily get any of that inheritance. Um, and you see that here. Now, Abram doesn't have any children whatsoever, male or female, at this point, but he's worried about a servant taking his possessions, uh, all his inheritance and, and all of that kind of stuff. It's a big deal to him. And so he's fearful of that. Now he's fearful of death. It's not necessarily death for himself. It's the, it's the idea of the ceasing of this family line, that my family ends with me. And, and that was a big deal. And so he's got some fear in there. Now, could he also maybe be wondering, and doesn't say it in the text, but maybe put yourself there for a moment. Um, what had recently taken place? in um, 14. Anybody remember? If you look back real quick and maybe look at some of those headlines in the text. Lot's captivity and rescue is not yeah. the subject of the Bible. Yeah, you remember that Abram goes out with his, uh, his little army and he rescues Lot and he goes against these kings. What might those kings or at least the descendants of those people do? Yeah, yeah, that could be a retaliation. Um, so that could be in his mind as well. We're not sure all of what's going on in his mind, but I know if it was me, again, this may not be Abram, but if it was me, I might be thinking, oh, you know, they're going to retaliate and we're going to keep having to have these fights. And what does God assure Abram in 15? Protect him. He said, I am your your protector or your shield. Some translations say shield, maybe it says protector. Yeah, so if God is for Abram, yeah, and didn't God make that promise to him earlier on, right? When he called him out, he said, basically, those who are will curse you, I'll curse them, and those who bless you, I'll bless them. He was basically saying, your enemies are my enemies, you know, and, and your Friends or my friends will we'll work together on this kind of thing. So he's kind of reiterating that again. I'm going to protect you. Don't, you don't have to worry about it. I'm going to protect you. And um, in many ways, we have a very similar promise in the New Testament. If God is for us, who can be against us? Um, what is the worst that the world could do to us? Kill us. Right? And in fact, that is the weapon that a lot of regimes use. What did the Nazis use? I mean, they tortured, but they basically, they're killing people. That's, that's what they used as a weapon. What did Rome, does anybody know what Rome used as a weapon? Ancient, ancient Rome? Well, they had the games and stuff, and if you were a slave, you might be put in there. But they crucified people, they killed people. That was the weapon. The weapon is death, right? You mess around and we'll take your life. Well, for the Christian, what does that mean? Right, right. Um, here's one of the things that 
I, I struggle with, and maybe you do too, is recognizing that that really is, that's the worst they can do, and the worst they can do is not that bad. Do you know what I mean? When, when the Christians in the, in the early church, after the time of uh, the apostles, the New Testament, when Rome would come in, take them, they'd, they'd bring them into the, the games, the gladiator games, and they would crucify them, they would burn them uh, at, their, at their parties at night, Nero took Christians, lit them on fire, provided, took our family. Provided light for the parties. Yeah, yeah, for his parties in his garden. Like we're gonna we're gonna use these guys as lamps. Yeah. And they would they would take the children, and they would wrap them in like sheep's clothing and blood, and they would throw them to wild dogs and animals in in the arena. And do you know that there's records of some of these Christians walking into these theaters where they're going to their death? singing hymns and some people recording that said they entered into the arena they entered into it as if they were entering into the worship service they were rejoicing that, that a struggle for you I gotta confess that's that sounds like a struggle to me, you know, it's the world that we live in and stuff, but you know that we have brothers and sisters in the world today who are doing very similar things, right? In other parts of the world, they're going to their death singing praises to God. The worst they can do is death, but death has been defeated, hasn't it? Well, they're taking the one thing that humanity fears, and that's the difference between children of God and people that don't. <laughs> Yeah. We don't have that spirit of fear, so we know death is not the end, but that's a blessing. For yeah. Us. And Jesus said, right, don't fear the one who can kill the body. So that's fear that's him who can cast both body and soul into, into hell. Um, we need to fear God. We need to honor and revere and respect him overall. So God says to Abram, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be your shield. I'm going to be your protector, isn't it? There's nothing uh, that's going to happen to you that I can't protect you from, that I can't work out for good and all of that kind of stuff. And, and we've got to also remember, part of what's going on here is God is going to bring about Jesus. And so, now Abram doesn't know all the details to that. But, his, but God's plan is redemptive for all humanity. Can anything stand in God's way of redeeming humanity? No. And again, no, Abram doesn't fully understand that, but he knows there's something. And it was mentioned last week that he was looking for a city whose builder and architect and, and foundations are not here on earth. So he, had, he did have a spiritual perspective. Uh, but he's, he's, got, he's got moments of being fearful. He's concerned about not having children, might be concerned about retaliation and things of that nature. But God's going to be with him. He's going to protect him. Um, even if these people come back, God is gonna God is gonna fight the fight for him and win these fights. Um, so God assures him, but then God brings him outside to look at the stars. What are, what are some of the things we talked about about why God might have done that? To show his ultimate authority and power over creation, that he can do anything. Sure. Yeah, because if he's the one who speaks the stars into existence. He can assure Abram an offspring, a child. He, I, you know, I can do this, Abram. Don't worry. I'm not powerless or I'm not weak. I created this, this all. But he also, and I think, I think Richard, you mentioned this, just the idea of, and it says it in the text as well, it's innumerable. You know, your, your family is going to grow and grow and grow. And the promise is coming from the one who made these stars. So you can, you can be assured of that kind of thing. Uh, so you don't have to worry too much about that. So he makes a covenant with Abram, and he promises him something else. Uh, verse 7, and he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, that's Abram, said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? You know, in the verse before this, it says, Abram believed God and was counted to him as righteousness, right? Great man of faith. Now, he believed him that he was going to have an offspring. That's what that context is about. God now promises him that your offspring, are going to, you're going to have this land. 
And Abram's looking for what? An answer, uh, confirmation. Yeah, like, more, like uh, again, more confirmation kind of thing. Um, I don't know if he's, again, he's got those moments like we do at times, you know, believe in God and then, oh, struggling and believe, you know, kind of like back and forth. We talked about the, the guy who comes before Jesus and says, um, I believe, help my unbelief, unbelief right? Um, it almost seems to be a little like, uh, you know, he wants to want to believe, but he's struggling. Um, and, and maybe that's what's going on here with Abram. Maybe he's kind of bouncing back and forth a little bit. And do we ever do that? Yeah, I mean, I do that at times, right? I, like one moment I'm on fire and yes, yeah, take on the world for Jesus and we'll move to Missouri. And then the next moment I'm here and I'm having panic attacks. Um, <laughs> that's real. Uh, the day after we moved in, that Thursday, we moved in Wednesday, Thursday morning, I woke up and I thought, what have I done? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Funny now. Was it, was it funny back then? But we have those. You're wondering that, are you? <laughs> um, no. no, but we have those moments too. I, I have. I've had those moments where, I mean, it wasn't a, as big a deal as Abram or, or maybe what you've gone through and you've had faith in God and you've gone and done what God said. But, you know, moving for us, it was a big deal or whatever. So we sure. said trust and obey. <laughs> then we got here. And, it was, <laughs> and we had that moment of, or I did anyways, I had that moment. So I can relate to Abram. And, and I, I, my guess is that probably most of us here can as, as well. Um, not that we're proud of it, not that we, we don't want to grow, but we can kind of put ourselves in the, in the same place as Abram. You know, we're like that. And God is patient with us. That's good. That's good news. So he says, um, okay, God, you're going to promise me this land, but how do I know? And here is where we get what you were talking about, Mike. God says, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to take some animals and I want you to cut them in half. Except the birds. Birds are too small, don't cut them in half. Why does God, why does God make a covenant with Abram like this? Why, why does he have him cut these animals in half and line them up? Anybody know? Lacey? Are you looking for your notes? <laughs> and here you are, you are, you're like, I can't find the notes. <laughs> um, back at this time, this was the way that kings and noblemen made covenants with one another, agreements with one another. Why did you save me? <laughs> Should have jumped in, Nikki. Son. <laughs> well, you get the. My you you knew that, right? Yeah. No, you cut them in half, you separate them, and what they would do is they would go hand in hand. It's a blood covenant. They would hand in hand, they would take each other's hand, they would go through the pieces together, and they would agree. Your friends are my friends. Uh, if you need money, you know, my money's your money, that kind of thing. And it was a lifelong covenant. That's what it was meant to be, lifelong. That was the culture. So what God is doing is God is assuring Abram in a, in a, a cultural practice that he understood. He's using that to say, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Now, what is the interesting aspect of this covenant? Normally... Two parties walk through, and what were they saying with the cut in half animals? Why cut them in half and walk through them? What were they saying with that image? Anybody remember? We did talk about it last week. We did. <laughs> we did. They were saying, let, I'm positive. We do have we do have audio proof. You can go back and listen to it. I wasn't here. That's why. Oh, there you go. That's why you didn't know, Richard. I know you were. Here. Um, what they were saying was, if I break covenant with you, may I be like these animals? May what has happened to these animals happen to me? In a sense, they were binding themselves. What you would might say, uh, uh, an oath or a curse or whatever. They, they were saying. May I be cut in half like these animals? Um, we touched on uh, Jeremiah. If you're taking notes, this would be 
connected to this passage here. Why are we cutting animals in half? So in Jeremiah 34 and verse 18, I'll read what it says. You can just mark it down if you'd like. But it's Jeremiah 34, 18. Uh, make it connected to this passage here in Genesis. It says, And the men who transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before me, I will make them like the calf that they cut in two and pass between its parts. Ain't that exactly what I said? God says, I'm going to do that to them. Who did that but that was the common understanding that if you made this covenant you made this pact you were saying this is till death do us part kind of thing and if I ever go back on it may I be chopped in two like this may I be disfigured and all of that kind of stuff this is a serious thing now according to the text um, who passes through God does God does now he does it in, in, in an image right What's the, what's the two images that pass through that represent God? Uh, starting in verse 17. Okay, one, uh, yours says a burning lamp. Okay, so mine says a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch. Same thing, right? Uh, fire and smoke representing God. Now, Abram doesn't pass through, right? doesn't say Abram passed through. It says these symbolic representations of God passed through. That's unusual because, as I said, both parties would go through and say, let, us, you know, let me be like this animal if I break this covenant. Now, God is basically saying... Yeah, God is making an unconditional promise, covenant. Um, regardless of what Abram does, uh, if, if he lies and steals and cheats and all that kind of stuff, and we're going to see that he fails at times. He does do some of those things. But God doesn't revoke that covenant because the covenant is, again, bigger than Abram, right? It, it's, and, of course, God calls him to be faithful and we'll see that Abram is faithful. You know, he works, God works with him, takes him through it. But this is an unconditional promise, an unconditional covenant. The only one who's actually making the promise here is God. God is, because remember, God is the one who said to Abram, your people are going to have this land. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be with you, all of that kind of stuff. Abram didn't make any promise. God didn't say, I want you to make sure that you, you know, you never lie again. Did Abram lie before? Before this? Yeah. Yeah. He goes down to Egypt and he lies, right? Um, did, he, did he fear and break, you know, in a sense, waver in his faith when he went down to Egypt? He did, because there was a famine in the land. He was afraid of the famine. God's not going to protect me, whatever. So Abram's failures are not going to hinder God fulfilling his promise. So it's an unconditional covenant. God makes other covenants that are conditional. Um, when we get to the nation of Israel, God makes a covenant of blessing and cursing with them. God, through Moses, will go up on the side of one mountain. And Moses will say, if you, people of Israel, if you do all that God has called you to do, um, he's going to bless you. Your land is going to prosper. Your you're going to have many babies, all that kind of stuff. And then he goes up on the other mountain and he says, but if you are not faithful, if you follow false gods, if you do this, that, or the other, the land is going to vomit you out. You're, you're chill. You won't have children. They'll have defects. They're, your animals won't do it. It's blessing and cursing. There were requirements with that covenant. It was conditional. Now, God makes a blood covenant with us today, doesn't he? And it's through the blood of? Jesus. Jesus. Is there, are there conditions on our covenant with God? Yes. What's the condition? Be obedient. Be obedient. Be faithful to the Lord. Um, absolutely. We must stay connected to him. So there are. There are um, conditions upon our being in a covenant with, with God. Um, a person, and there are people out there today who believe this. I don't know where they get it in the scripture. But they believe that once saved, always saved. And I've even heard... People say, well, if they had an experience, if someone had, let's say Mike. We're going to use Mike for an example. Mike, 
he, he comes to faith in Christ. He's immersed into the death, burial, resurrection. He's in covenant with God. And then he goes away and becomes an atheist. Mike is still saved. At the end of his life, he'll go to be in, in glory with God. Now, where in the scriptures they find that, I don't know. Um, I, I find warnings about being faithful, about not falling away, all of that kind of stuff. But just to say there are people out there who believe that the New Testament covenant is unconditional, very similar to the one that God makes with Abram. Uh, but they're different. We do see they're different, right? It's, they're still covenants, they're blood covenants, but there's differences. One is an unconditional one. The other has conditions on our part that we must remain connected to Christ. We must be faithful to him. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, I had a pastor tell me one time. Um, I don't know where he got this from, but it threw me for a loop. But uh, he said, kind of like something similar, that once you're saved, you're always saved. And he's like, I could leave here right now. I could go kill somebody, and I'm still going to heaven. Yeah. When he That's... told me that, I was like, there is no possible way that if you have God, you're going to go out here and kill somebody and think you're still going to heaven. Yeah, that's uh, you know, problematic. It's, uh, but you, you can see that it, it, that kind of stuff has an impact on the way people behave, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, you can go to a religious building for religious services with people who claim to be Christians, and they're in adultery and fornication and lying and stealing and cheating and all this kind of stuff, and nobody is getting disciplined. Nobody is being, you know, rebuked or cast out or anything like that because, well, we're all going to heaven anyways and God would never, you know, you can't lose your salvation. Kind of like what that guy was saying. This is based on faith. So if you don't have faith, enough faith to believe in God, just like the mustard seed, then you're in trouble. And you have to have faith. Yeah, and faith is always connected with obedience. You can't, you can't separate the two. Faith is not a mental assent of, oh, I believe God, and then live your life the way you want to. It, there has to be a connection between, well, James says, even the demons believe. That same word is the word faith. Even the demons have faith in God, that there is one God and all that, but they ain't saved. So um, absolutely got to be got to be mindful of those kind of things. We're called to be holy. We're called to be righteous. We're called to, you know, constantly be getting better, be sanctified through him and all of that. Okay. Yes? Um, faith is the substance of things hoped for, things not seen. Right. Yeah. So here is a great example of that, right? Abram is now believing God, faith. Faith believes, trusts, obeys. Um, and God is going to make these covenants, and so he's going he's to continue to follow God. He'll, he'll have those struggles and waver at times, but he's going he's gonna to believe God, right? Uh, earlier on, God said, you're going to have a child. I'm going to you know, make sure it comes from your body. And Abram believes God, and it's counted to him as righteousness. So we do see that in there. He didn't see it. He was walking by faith, walking by faith. Absolutely. Okay. Um, the smoking fire pot and the flaming torch. What is the context of the land promise? What, what, is God, what does God say about the, um, the children of Abram who are going to inherit the land in the text we read? What's, what's he say about them? They will be like the sand. That's right. They're going to be a large number. What's going to happen to them? Are they going to inherit the land right away? Not right away. All right. It's going to be how many years? 400, 400 years. Yeah. And those 400 years are going to be, you know, it's going to be blue skies and <laughs> rainbow. Probably <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah, because they're going to be where? It's going to be in bondage. Rainbow. I know where that's from. They're going to be, <laughs> they're going to be in bondage. Yeah. They're going to be in Egypt. And they're going to be in suffering and in slavery for 400 years years and God is going to bring them up so part of of the context of what God is doing is he's talking about the exodus event right and that what he's talking about he's talking about the exodus event they're going to go down into Egypt then they're going to come out 
So where in the Exodus story do we ever see something about smoke and fire? Leading them. God leads them in what way? By a pillar of cloud or smoke and then a pillar of fire. Do you, do you see what's... That's the representation here is the smoke and the fire. You could say the cloud and the fire, that kind of imagery. It's pointing forward to the Exodus event. God makes a covenant with Abram this way. Now who's writing and recording Genesis? Moses. Moses. And God brought them out and did that. So this is going to make sense to the Israelites who hear it. They're going to make the connection between God leading them in the pillar of cloud and fire and the covenant he makes with Abram as God passes symbolically right through these halves of animals in the pillar of cloud, we could say, in the pillar of fire. So there's a pointing forward in Abram's life, prophetically pointing forward to the whole Exodus event that God is going to lead them in this in this way. So is there any imagery in there that would be similar to the day of Pentecost with cloven tongues and the fire, the the symbol of the coming of the Spirit and the beginning of the church or well, that be something completely different fire and smoke are often related to God in different ways mm -hmm. because of the context I think the heaviest emphasis and the heaviest symbolism that we should be able to see is the exodus mm -hmm. this is God pointing to an mm -hmm. exodus event now the exodus event as a whole is pointing towards mm -hmm. it's pointing to Christ mm -hmm. It's pointing to the, the the final, you know, the fulfillment of this Exodus point, you know, that's going to happen. But the biggest, um, the closest imagery should be the Exodus imagery. But God is a consuming fire. Fire. Um, when Isaiah sees God, uh, the temple is filled with smoke. Right? It's filled. You know, this cloud. Uh, the cloud comes down on top of the mountain, and the mountain has got both fire. Fire's on the mountain, right? With Moses, he goes up in the mountain, there's a cloud, all that. So the imagery of both of those is, th throughout the rest of the scriptures, we'll see tongues of fire, the symbolic of God's presence, right? the Spirit's presence, that kind of thing. So there is a connection between when you see God either in the smoke or the cloud or the fire or something like that. But the the closer, the closer image we should focus on is the Exodus above those mm -hmm. other ones. I think it's there, but it's a lighter, you know. Exodus is really what we should be seeing, at least in my view, of the cloud and the fire. Go ahead, Elaine. Um, <laughs> Exodus 13, um, verse 1 and 22. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Right. Absolutely. So that could be a great reference. If I was making notes and, and making marginal references and things, I would connect that right there. That's what the Israelites are seeing. That's what Moses is, you know, being shown. But it's also confirmation of, of the fulfillment of God's promise. You know, there's all these strings that are connected. Um, and, and the people of Israel should be looking back and saying, oh, look at that. Uh, the imagery of the Exodus and God kept his promise. If God kept his promise back then, bringing them out, God can keep the, his promise to us today. There's an assurance, and we should get the same assurance. As we go through the scriptures and we see that God is faithful, and God is always you know, keeping his word and his covenants and all of that, then we should begin and grow in our understanding that God is not gonna, not, God's not going to lie to us. God's not going to break covenant with us. If he says something, he's going to do it. We might not know how. We might not know when. 
but God's going to do it. And, and that's the challenge for Abram too, right? The challenge for Abram is be faithful, continue to walk with me, Abram. I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do, but it's going to be a while. That's right. Now, that's hard to deal with, isn't it? It's hard to deal with. We're impatient. We want results. You know, we want tangible things that we can see instantly. Otherwise, you know, we lose faith and we lose hope. We're only human, you know. We, we that's right. Back on our lives. We can see miracles in our own minds when we're concentrating on these kind of promises. God has always been faithful. Um, but there, there is where Abram is struggling as well. It's been a long time. God still hasn't fulfilled his promise. He said, I'm going to have a child. And one of the things Abram says to God is, you haven't given me one yet. You promised it, but you haven't given it to me yet. And God is trying to say, be patient. Be patient. Um, it's going to happen. I brought up the, um, the issue of the woman who was suffering with blood for 12 years. Yeah. She didn't get healed for 12 years. And God was doing something in the midst of all that. But can you imagine how difficult? This isn't a week or two. This isn't a month or two. This isn't a year or two. This is 12 years of pain and suffering. And she has to wait and endure. And then finally Jesus comes on the scene and, and heals her. It would be a difficult time. And being an outcast, she would have been like a leper. Or a... Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because she would have been unclean. Mm -hmm. She's unclean, which is why, and this gets us into the Gospels, but, and that, that's why she sneaks up on him. She sneaks up on him because she shouldn't have been in the crowd in the first place. And she definitely shouldn't have been touching him or anybody else. And if she touched you, that made you unclean. Just like if you touched a leper, it made you unclean. The great thing about Christ is, when anybody touches him or he touches you, the opposite happens. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't become unclean. No. You become clean. And that's what happens with that woman. But she shouldn't have been there, which is why she tries to hide, too. You remember, she tries to hide. And God, Jesus, says to her, where is the woman? Where is the person who touched me? I think he's doing what God did in the garden. Adam, where are you? Calling her to come out. Calling her to come out. But anyways, that gets us into some other areas. That's right. That's right. He's like, no, no, no. We're going to call her out. All right. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Absolutely. Uh, we'll pray for that uh, right now. Um, Mike, you mind uh, closing this in prayer and, and praying for... Uh... Yes, thank you.